So if the Navier-Stokes equation is an unsolved mathematical problem, if we have been trying to find a solution for 150 years but haven't managed, then what is this equation doing in computational fluidonomics? What is it doing inside our computers? What, what are we doing with that? Well, let's take a very brief, basic look at how computational fluidonomics uses that equation to find solutions. So we have computers, and computers, com computational fluidonomicists um, always like you to believe it's magic. You turn on the computer, you wait for a while, and you produce very beautiful results. So you have here, uh, for example, the fluid flow over a motorbike, and you can have extraordinarily nice pictures with the flow velocity at every point in space. And from this, you can deduce the distribution of pressure and shear and objects like this motorbike here. It's all very nice and beautiful. Uh, usually the colors are just extraordinary. Uh, so how does it work? <laughs> we said we have two equations to solve. We have uh, the divergent of velocity is zero, which is the mass conservation equation. And then we have the momentum balance equation, the Navier-Stokes equation here. Now this has three components. And the unknown in all this is the velocity field. Yeah, we want to know how the fluid flows around a given problem. So instead of having this, um, this is the X component of the equation, we're going to try to get rid in there of all these partial derivatives. All these mathematical operators here work on functions, but if we don't have a function, um, then how can we find those? What we're going to do is we're going to split the problem into discrete spatial elements. So we take the volume of study here in this picture here, only the, the this flat surface, but in practice it's a three-dimensional grid that we have. We split this into little boxes, and inside each of those boxes there's only one value of pressure, one value uh, for velocity, and one value for shear, and so on and so forth. So we have discrete elements uh, with discrete values of the properties, and in between those elements then we just, um, we just interpolate, we just pretend it's a continuous distribution. If we have this, then we can replace our previous equation um, with now finite differences, with delta values. And to be to be rigorous about how we write them, we have to write them with a little index here. Because this little delta is a change, the, the finite change of velocity in a finite amount of time. Um, and this is expressed as a function of the velocity itself multiplied by the finite change of velocity across a finite amount of space, and so on and so forth. So every time, instead of a partial differential of a function, we have here just a finite difference over a finite difference. This is in principle. So in principle here, with this equation, we can, we can compute things. Um, and so the principle becomes this. We have the same equation again. I just put colors in there. We rearrange this expression to have the finite change uh, with respect to time of the velocity field everywhere. This is what we want to calculate how it changes with time. So you say, for example, this little piece of time would be one millisecond. And you want to compute how the velocity field uh, changes with time. And for this, you start with your initial guess uh, for velocity. And this, this guess is the complete velocity field V and the value of P. So all the value in green, all the values plotted green here in this, in this equation, all of those are your initial guess for the velocity distribution and the pressure distribution. And based on this, you compute within one millisecond, which is here, what delta you have to apply to this um, to get the velocity field at the next time step. So what you do is you march in time. You take step by step, compute how the velocity field changes until hopefully, um, if you configured your simulation well enough, you converge towards a finite state, towards a state that is actually physical, that's actually meaningful. Yes? So knowing the present, sometimes even guessing the present state, what you calculate with CFD is the future. You calculate the little incremental change that you have to apply to the present state to get the future state. And this is the principle of CFD. Yes? So the conclusion I'd like you to, to see in there um, is that understanding the mathematical nature of the Navier-Stokes equation. So how it's constructed um, and what it says and doesn't say about the flow um, is essential if you want to play with computers, if you want to be able to communicate with fluid dynamicists that use computers. Yes, it has very direct
practical consequences. And for that reason, um, it's worth spending your time on the problem sheet of this chapter, which is only dealing with the mathematical structure of those equations, because understanding this will make you able to communicate with real-world fruit analysis.